in this episode of Mind Pump. So, of course, we talk all about fitness, health, nutrition, fat loss, muscle building, but we also talk about current events and ourselves. That's our favorite topic. And all that jazz. We do that in the intro portion of this episode. So here's what we talked about in the first 40 minutes. We talk about Mind Pump Kitchen. We have a new um, site, hashtag. If you hashtag Mind Pump Kitchen, you can see new foods and things created by our chefs. Mm. Healthy foods. Delicioso. And we're working with uh, Butcher Box Meat. They're the makers of and deliverers of grass-fed meat. So if you sign up with Butcher Box, they will deliver to your door the highest quality grass-fed beef, chicken, um, and pork, bacon. They have amazing products. Scallops. They are one of our sponsors. So if you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, here's what you will get. Now, this is going on between the 22nd of this month and the 29th of next month. If you sign up, this is crazy. You'll get ground beef for life. What? That's right. Ground beef forever. New members will get two pounds of grass-fed Grass finished. Taco beef Tuesday forever. In every box for the life of your subscription. Again, just go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump. Um, then we talked about the Chris Delia uh, comedy show. Justin and I took our girls over there and laughed our asses off. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a good time. Adam brought up the social media uh, app TikTok. I guess that's what all the kids are using. I talked about how I was finally able to help my son with homework. It wasn't math, so I could actually help him out. Uh, Justin has a man shed in the backyard. He can now escape yeah. and go hide by it's himself. It's like a panic room for you know married guys. <laughs> Death Row Records has a new owner, um, and you won't believe who it is. We'll talk about it in, this, in that part of this episode. <laughs> we talk about how Gillette lost $8 billion because of their terrible advertising. That's what they get. Mm, that was a mistake, guys. Uh, we, go, we talk about the Amazon fire that's happening right now, and uh, that's a third rail, so hopefully we don't piss everybody off. Uh, we talked about how KFC now has vegan nuggets, which is kind of weird if you don't like animals being killed. I don't know why yeah. you'd go to KFC in the first place. Yeah. Uh, we talked about how there was an Australian couple that almost killed their daughter by putting on a vegan diet. Um, and then we talked about the things you need to know before becoming an Uber driver. I also want to mention that our live event is coming up. That's next month. We're going to be with Mike Matthews here in San Jose. If you want to sign up for that live event, make sure you visit mindpumplive.com. Uh, the tickets will be on sale as long as they are available. The first come, first serve. So here's the first question in the fitness portion of this episode. This person wants to know what our thoughts are on the Whole30 diet. So we kind of break it down and give our opinion. The next question, this person wants to know if vegetables and fruits carry equal weight. Every, you always hear people say, eat your fruit and vegetable. Mm. Which more important, vegetables or fruit? The next question, this person wants to know what we would talk to a high school gym class about um, if we were able to talk to some high school students. And the final question, this person wants to know what we think about microwaves. Um, our friend Paul Check says you shouldn't use them. So we give our opinion. Are microwaves okay? Are they safe or are they bad? Get out the tinfoil hat. Also, we have launched a brand new MAPS program, MAPS OCR. Yeehaw! OCR stands for Obstacle Course <laughs> Race. So Obstacle Course Race is super like popular now. Uh, races like Spartan Race, Tough Mudder. Um, these are races that test your spirit, your mind, and your body. Now, here's the problem. Training for obstacle course races, super confusing. What do I do? Do I just run and lift weights? What kind of mobility work do I do? Like, How do I get myself in shape? How do I get my grip in shape? A lot of people talk about their grips being the weakest link. How do I prepare for that? Well, we've designed a program for you. In fact, this program comes with a pre-phase, meaning we can get you from couch to obstacle course race. We can get you ready from beginning to end. And then for those of you that work out on your own and you're already kind of fit, you just start in phase one. So this program has everything. There's daily practices to toughen up your body, um, toughen up your hands, get you used to- And preserve your body. Changes in temperature. There's mo a mobility component because uh, OCR racing can be very demanding on the body. So we help you prevent injury, maximize your body's movement. There's endurance and stamina components. This one has running and sprinting involved, strength training. Um, and you can do this at home. There's also a way to do this entire program at home. Or you can use the gym and use gym equipment. Now, this program is brand new. So we're launching it right now, which means it's $30 off. And this is going on until September 1st. And we're going to give you a free t-shirt and... 
you're going to get a pair of brand new Gooder sunglasses. These are the. But sungla- wait, there's more. <laughs> These are the sunglasses that sponsor Amelia Boone. Amelia Boone also uh, includes some coaching tips in this program, so she's in there talking to you and explaining to you what it's like to do a race and answers all the common... All the secret hacks. Yeah, questions that people have like, how do I go underneath the barbed wire and what do, how do I carry the bucket and all that kind of stuff. Oh, and by the way, if you sign up now, um, this is for a limited time, you'll also get 10% off a Spartan race. There's a code that you're going to get that will hook you up with a discount for the Spartan race. So again, to recap, if you go to mapsocr.com and use the code... OCR30, the number 30, no space. Here's what you'll get. You'll get $30 off the brand new Maps OCR program. You'll get a free t-shirt. You'll get a pair of Gooder sunglasses and 10% off your Spartan race. All of this while supplies last and the discount will end September 1st. So make sure you act now. I got some cool news for our audience. Are you wearing uh, socks with sandals, by the way? I am bringing back this. Wow, that's like a cardinal rule Yeah, right sorry there. to change the topic yes. here. But so, how I did, dare I, you? I did this because uh, Danny was rocking this yesterday, and he was making fun of Taylor about it. And I told Danny, I said, bro, that's that's 1996. Like, I for <laughs> Rules have changed since then, Yeah, huh? Yeah, so that's that. I used to do this when I was in high school. Damn. I have wow. not done this. Since 1996. I mean, I like it. Well, I like socks all the time. So you have to be able to like go from you know the locker room or the weight room towards somewhere, you know, with that. So that's the idea of this, right? So that's the whole point when, or at least when we were kids. I don't know if it's turned into a style now where kids are just doing it to do it. But when we played basketball, you you first of all, basketball sneakers never touched outside. Like that was like a rule when you were a kid. So really, ba- yeah, basketball sneakers were made for the court, only the court. Mm. And you didn't let them touch outside, so you wore your flip flops with your, you know, your Nike socks, and because you want everybody to know you're serious. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. how am I going to let everybody know I play basketball if my basketball shoes are in my bag? Well, it's actually more of a. It <laughs> was more socks. It was more of a convenient thing, right? So we used to be, or at least at our school when we were kids, you could, they would they would open up uh, the gym, so even at lunchtime you could play basketball. So you would wear the sandals and socks like we are now. I'd have my, I'd always have my, you know, basketball sneakers in my locker or in my gym bag with me. And then come lunchtime, you go straight to the court and you just got to throw your sandals off real quick, throw your basketball shoes on. You're good to go. Ready to rock and roll. Yeah, yeah ready to rock and roll. But so ne- now actually- next level is when you have, because you have the sandals where the strap is over no. the foot. The Jesus sandals. Next level is when you have the one that goes in between your toes with socks on. <laughs> no, yeah. no, then you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Yeah, you don't do that. That's how I do it. No, oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you would do. Like you that. do everything. You know backwards. what that reminds me of? What? It reminds me of like the the uh, like ninja shoes. You ever seen the ninja shoes? There's always it looks like the like one toe is separated from the rest. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like ninja turtle. It looks like little camel toe shoes. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's yeah, all that's, wedged. That's what I like. To, <laughs> that's what I like to do. Yeah. It just feels comfortable. I don't know. You're yeah. an, I don't you're know an if asshole. I'm buying this new style. Yeah, I don't. I, you know, I was. It was kind of comfortable this morning. What the what? How it pl- happened? Right? It wasn't well planned. Yesterday. Uh, Danny did the post. I was DMing back and forth, teasing about teasing about it, saying like that was 1996. He was like, I was one years old. So obviously he doesn't remember this. It was <laughs> he was one year old. <laughs> yeah. So according to him, like he thinks this is like a thing now, right? And I'm like, no. This he is thinks a, he invented it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Why he anybody put this together. I think he did it teasing Taylor first, and I think Taylor and Taylor's like uh, an old soul, right? He's one of those guys who's he's always listening. I mean, his license, 90s R&B. Yeah, <laughs> favorite music of all time. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's got on his license plate. Yeah. Yeah. What is does it say? 90s R&B. Yeah. Oh, is that the... Oh, that's that, hilarious. That's his yeah, license dude. plate. Oh, my God. You didn't know that? Taylor, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. He probably got hit the hardest with the R. Kelly stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, I think it yeah. broke his heart. Probably was, broke his heart I think he was bit. depressed for like three months, dude. Like, after man, that. why could be peeing on everybody, man? <laughs> yeah, he's like, like oh, one of my man, favorite really artists. Like your he still defends him. <laughs> but, yeah. his, but his music's good. Yeah. <laughs> but he's right. talented. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so anyways, I was going to start this podcast off on talking about something that we just did uh, recently. This was really cool. So I know Rachel had been working on this uh, for a while. We've been talking about this on the show for a long time, and it's finally here. So I'm excited that uh, we're doing this now, and it's just another way to uh, enhance the experience for any Mind Pump listeners or people that are following us on social media. Mind Pump Kitchen has uh, been officially launched, and it's starting off as uh, just a weekly post on Instagram, uh, we've we've collaborated uh, with I believe it's my paleo chef. I'll get this uh, Instagram. We tag him every time. 
uh, he actually posed for us. So he's actually taking the photos. He's putting. He's a chef, and he's creating these incredible recipes. And it was cool because Rachel reached out to Butcher Box the other day and and asked if they would actually ship over uh, a Butcher Box to him. So he received a bunch of stuff, and then he took the meat from there and made a recipe. Mm. So awesome! You can go to the hashtag if you follow the hashtag Mind Pump Kitchen. You can start to follow all the recipes. Yeah, what was meals. that Thai basil one he did just that's, recently? That's the, the butcher beef? box. That's the oh, butcher box one. Man, yeah. that looked delicioso. Healthy no. and delicious. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. So right now that you'll you'll get an image of it. Uh, you'll get the recipe and then the cooking instructions on how to do it. Uh, of course, the the future is hopefully we'll start to do uh, videos that will later on live in YouTube and things like that. But for now, you can uh, you can guarantee that there'll be a post every single week with a new recipe. Uh, it'll be it'll be healthy, but it also tastes amazing. Is Doug gonna? Or Doug, are you gonna contribute your uh, Brussels sprout recipe? It's a possibility. Oh, I would love that. I yeah. would love that. Yeah, I think I think eventually I think we'll all it's legendary contribute to we, it. Really? Yeah. yeah. Broccoli. For well, me. <laughs> yeah, I, should, I yeah. guess I should say all of us. I'll do like yeah. nuggets. Yeah, a few, yeah. A few of us. Yeah. Yeah. Just, to, just to inflate, we'll have nuggets and ketchup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new thing I just came up of with, the guys. Like, what the yeah. fuck is this mind pump kitchen? Uh, this is delicious. Terrible. I steal from well, my Doug, kids all Doug time. and I like to make healthy, good recipes, so maybe Doug and I will contribute to this. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, this actually, smoke. I mean, I did have. So, Butcher Box also has Don't chicken. Fucking lie. Listen, I didn't come up Listen, with it. Okay? <laughs> it wasn't my idea or anything. Like Courtney does, really put some good stuff together like so if you had a caprese salad so it was basically the same kind of ingredients but with chicken so it had like so the chicken the, the chicken the, the mozzarella and the uh basil and then the uh, um the vinegar on top the balsamic vinegar <laughs> say mozzarella Mo- mozzarella mo- you, you said mo- it mozzarella yeah see you almost did it you <laughs> oh, i was trying uh, <laughs> an accident that to sounds really you. good so it's cold you you cook it up chop it up and then put it in the fridge and you have it cold it's good man. oh yeah speaking of that who'd you, who'd you go see this weekend justin we Chris D'Elia. <laughs> I want, I want Is that how you say it? I don't know. Dude. I don't know, dude. I don't, I don't know. You guys got me both confused because I've heard it like two different ways now. I mean, that's how I read it. <laughs> I think uh, it's Delia. Delia. Yeah, Delia. I think it's Chris Delia. Anyway, he's hilarious. Hilarious. He's, he's, yeah, you guys went. Oh, yeah. my God. So it's his new act. It's his new bit that he's doing, and he's going to be recording. Didn't he say he was going to be recording like next week, the, the yeah, Netflix special? Yeah, so we had the first, uh, you know, we got to see it before it comes out on oh, Netflix. Oh, so this, was this all new material? All new. Yeah. Oh, cool. It was awesome. Nothing. So when you're somebody who, like all of us, are all into comedy, so we watch a yeah. lot of comedy, yeah. whether it be Netflix or you go, you know, it's... It, yeah, it, I watch a lot of comedy. It sucks when you go and you watch a show and you've already heard like all the jokes. Yeah. yeah. That's well, happened to me quite a few You know who times. else was funny was his opener. Yeah. What's that guy's name? Um, something. Lo- oh man, we got to pull up his remember, name. Dude. Maybe Doug can Google uh, comedian that opens for Chris uh, uh, Delia Delia. Because I want to give the guy, <laughs> I want to give the guy some props because he was also absolutely hilarious. Or his dick towel, the, 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 that <laughs> yeah. closer, his closing yeah. bit on this whole thing about sex was just so funny. Like Courtney was crying. Uh, so did was, you guys like Chris's this one better than his last one or, or what? Yes. Um, I think it was, I yeah, I think it was better. I think it was excellent. He's always good. The guy always kills. Me. His Instagram destroys me. Yeah. I cannot look at his, what's his name? How do you pronounce his name? Brian Callen. No, no, oh. no, no, no. His opener. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got we to gotta get his name, Doug. I got to give him a plug. Yeah, well, uh, oh, there it is. Michael, Michael, Ono, uh, Michael Inochi. There you go. Where do you Michael see Michael Inochi. I didn't even see it. It says at Michael Inochi. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. So he's he's been traveling with Chris and just hilarious. No, he's yeah, he's mastered. I think it was like what like 30 minute set that he did, but mm-hmm. he just the, the whole thing was super tight yeah. and he killed it. Yeah. Dude, you know what I did not realize? Mm. So it, there's a stereotype about comedians, right? Where they're kind of disturbed. And they have like bad childhoods. You guys know that, right? You've heard that stereotype. Right, right. Yeah. Most of them are really dark. Yeah. Well, the humor is always real dark, but they have kind of like bad past or whatever, and it kind of what fuels their comedy. Mm-hmm. Did you know that that Chris Delia had? I'm gonna fucked up his name again. Yeah. He's never ever had alcohol. Yeah. Never ever tried a single drug. And had a really good like childhood. Parents that loved him, <laughs> yeah. and so he like put that all That's in there. Part of his the material. Act. I didn't know that he's never yeah. had I'm alcohol. Supposed to be damaged. Never yeah. had alcohol. Yeah. Never had. Not even tasted. Not even tried ever. Yeah. Oh, interesting. That's weird. 
What is, isn't doesn't, yeah, sounds really boring. doesn't DL Hughley have some like a similar? Is it DL Hughley or is it uh, um, what's the other big comedian right now that has the the that we always talk about? He's fucking probably the most famous comedian right now. I can't think of his name. Right oh, now. you're talking about uh, man, short guy. Yeah, well, I can't think of his name I right don't now. Understand. <laughs> Justin, come on, you're you're comedy I know, guy. I am, I am. Uh, it's, see, it's contagious. You guys have like, oh, I can't think. No, I yeah, can't think. I wanted to say Chris Rock, but it's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe either one of you assholes know that off the top of your head right now. No, dude, he hangs out with The Rock all the time. Of They're course, good yes, of course. What's of his course. name? Of Chucky. course, she's good. Yes, yes, Kevin, Kevin Hart. Hart. God, Jesus, thank you. bunch of assholes, dude. What a bunch oh, of. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm it, embarrassed for that one. It's either either Kevin Hart or DL Higley has a uh, has like a childhood that was like I mean suburbia, like just fine. Like he wasn't like a because most of them are. Most of them have a fucked up story. Yeah. Yep. And like you said, that's kind of their outlet. But mm-hmm. ironically, I think some of the bigger guys now aren't like that. Yeah. They, no. Maybe because nowadays it takes more than just being dark and humorous. Like I think I feel like if you're a comedian today, you have to be pretty business savvy. Mm-hmm. Oh. Because I it's it's not just like, I, I mean I've heard these guys talk before about how you know some some of the most funniest people you'll meet they say are undiscovered like that mm-hmm. you just you you'll never you'll never get to see them. Well, or from what I've heard, I, this is at all not anywhere in my expertise, but from what I've heard, <clears throat> comedians often say that you need like five to ten years. Yeah, 10 is what I hear. Yeah, of just stand up before you even can break through. It's like a lot of work. And to put that much effort and energy into something that's not making you any money, you know, it's an art. And a lot of art is driven by, I hate to say, challenge and pain. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I don't know if it's true. I mean, it would be interesting to see real statistics, but I know that's the stereotype. Yeah, and it all depends on the style of your comedy, too. You know, like I I think uh, there's definitely, you could get that, like you have to be authentic in it. So it has to like reflect your own experience. You can't just like portray somebody that's like, you know, had all these like, crazy things happened to him and didn't really happen yeah well i don't i sometimes i feel like part of um why kevin hart is so massive is is i mean he's good don't get me wrong his comedy is hilarious it's great but i don't think he's even he's even a top 10 comic as far as his act and his bit and his comedy but he he'll go down in history as one of the oh most. yeah he's a beast uh, business wise yeah, yeah no he's, he's a fucking he savage can generate bro. insane sales he that, has to be one of the top uh wouldn't you how would you rank like rate the top comedians what, of no, all no, time. No, no, no. He'll be top all time. Just in terms of money. Money, 100%. Yeah. Money and success, he's probably number one already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know anybody who's probably generated more revenue than than he has, especially if you get to count movies and all the other things that he does. I mean, he's, Well, stand-up has become so massive now. At one point, I think it was in the 80s and 90s that really started to take off, but now because of Netflix and Amazon Prime and stuff like that, you know, stand-up comedy is becoming... A real big deal because back in the day it wasn't like you didn't necessarily go on and rent a, 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 a VHS of comedy. I think Eddie Murphy was probably one of the first comedians to kind of do that, right? Because before that, where would you get their where yeah, would you get their material? Prior was Richard he on Pryor. HBO or was he on VHS? Yeah, yeah so, so I remember watching that. Yeah, because Showtime and HBO were the ones that really promoted uh, stand up comedy. Yeah. Um, before that, I don't know. I don't know. I think it was Vegas. You had to go to kind of Vegas to listen to them. <laughs> You know, yeah. and now you have Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, and and it's a big, it's a big genre on Netflix. Yeah, it's there's a lots huge of genre. specials floating around. All kind, of, yeah. Amazon's a big one now. They just started. Uh, they had like Jim Gaffigan, and mm-hmm. they had Alonzo Bowden. I think. Yeah, I think I think the formula has been the same. It's just exploded. Like it, it, those comedy clubs have been around forever. So yes. yeah, I think that it, it was the same. You would go to comedy clubs, but it was just more underground. It was mm-hmm. you know if that's you were, what I mean. Yeah, if you were into comedy, it was probably a little more un- like how UFC was when it first mm-hmm. started the first decade. You well, know, comedy like, plays a, a very very important role in society, especially stand-up com- comedians, because they they have the ability to say the things that people want to think, Honestly, or that think, but I can't say. I think that's why it's so popular right now, and I've been waiting for that. I, I think like the biggest thing of going to a show like that was just laughing amongst everybody about like because everybody's just so tight and walking around these days, and like so worried about like you know pissing somebody off thing, or saying yeah. something wrong or being unpolitically correct and. It's just like it's so relieving to just <laughs> sit there and like you know like talk shit and bullshit. Speaking yeah. of this climate and every, you know everybody's so sensitive and shit. You know Sal brought up I don't know it was probably three months or more maybe it was six months it was somewhere between three and six months ago when you brought up TikTok. Mm-hmm. I saw that our buddy John Meadows was at one of the last Gary V talks and was asking Gary V about TikTok and he's pushing the shit out of it right now. Hmm. Yeah, his his stance is that he thinks it may be like the next kind of Instagram. 
And with these social media platforms, you have a, you have a huge advantage if you're one of the first people on there to kind of do well. Like if yeah. you were one of the first Instagram people um, and you got some some notoriety through that, then as the whole platform grew, you, you would blow up. So that was kind of his uh, – that was what he was kind of talking about. But I don't understand TikTok that much. It's definitely <laughs> being used by the younger, younger generation. It's, well, it's yeah. very uh, Vine-esque. You know, mm-hmm. it has – it's kind of a Vine slash Periscope slash uh, Instagram all blended into one, I feel like. Mm-hmm. That's what it looks like to me. Mm-hmm. Um and it, it to me, it's like what you brought up way back when, which is it seems to be the counterculture. The younger, younger generation, and I, I, I 100% attribute this to the meme culture because me, the meme culture, which is today's political cartoons, memes are very often um, not politically correct. In, right. in fact, memes can be extremely dark. Yeah. Some of the darkest humor I've ever seen are on memes, which is why I like them so much. And my son's generation, <clears throat> these young teenagers are all over – the memes. You know the memes that I post on my on my story? Yeah. I'll show my son and he'll like, oh, I saw that one last month. Oh, that's a year old. Oh, that's like, yeah. Oh, I saw that one. I'm like, what the? So he, he they're, they're all up and up on these on this whole meme culture and they're all super politically incorrect. And where so do TikTok's you get them got first? Is it, is Reddit. it Reddit? Yeah. I, I think Reddit's say. where everybody shares them and then they get upvoted uh. and you see which ones are good or not. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the place to, to, there's other places too, but if you want to see them kind of hit the- You like farm them there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go. Speaking, what are you guys going to come spe- up with? Speaking of my boy, I had this wonderful moment this weekend. I got to help him with his homework. <laughs> First time yeah. you could do it, you know. He had uh, he had some history homework, and uh, yeah, that, oh, that, good, no hey, math that no, never uh, changes. Yes, <laughs> that never gets harder. Yeah, you know, and I love history. Yeah, yeah. And it was World a, War World World War Two always has happened yeah. at the same time. Yeah, frame. exactly. And there Consistent. was a, there was a speech that he had to kind of break down, and so I got to help him with it because normally if this kid's math homework, he can't go to dad. You know what I mean? I don't know. They ain't gonna ask me. I I never asked me for help on his homework at yeah. all. The only time, actually, two times. This last time with his history homework, and then one time when he had to make a, a podcast. Then he asked me, and I was all super excited yeah. that I could help him. But he nice. knows better than to ask dad for any kind of help. What what part of history <laughs> is he studying right now? This was uh, Greek history. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was uh, Athens in particular. So we had a nice, fun discussion about that. It was pretty cool. Nice. I was all happy about that. Yeah. But otherwise, if it's math, I'm like, yeah, dude. <laughs> you're on your own, dude. Use Google. Yeah. That's how you're going to find out. Yeah, about that, that changes all the time. Yeah. Anyway, what'd you do this weekend? I was, uh, I actually was clearing everything out and, uh, uh, basically to, went on a bunch of dump runs with the kids. I, I feel like that's so necessary. Like I, I need, I need them to grab things and, and throw them away. Oh yeah. You know, like <laughs> this is, this is a good, healthy practice and man, it feels good once you get like all this clutter and junk and stuff outside of your house. Uh, and so I kept going and I'm like, oh wow, I'm on a roll. So I'm going to keep going. And I had this shed that I, that I don't use except for just like stuffing crap in it. And I literally got rid of Everything got rid of everything. I feel so good when you do that. Oh my god! And then I organized the whole thing, so now I turned it into like like tools. Like I put all my tools in there. It's like this little shed. And then I was like thinking about what we were talking about earlier, Adam, with your situation. You know, I'm like, I got a shed now. I got a place I can hide. You know, like this is my own space. Like I, I, so I, I found myself there for hours. Just like staring at things. No, you did Yeah, I did. I didn't didn't even go back to the house. They were doing things. And I'm just like, you know, in my own little world, just like organizing things. And, you know, so I'm like, oh, yes. You start to understand the stereotype of the dad who kind of disappears in his his garage or something like that. Oh, 100%. I get that already, dude. Just to get away. Dude, I'm the 50s dad. I might as well have a flat top. For sure. You know what I mean? And I'm just like tinkering on stuff. I think that's that's probably the... Katrina's favorite thing about having a kid now is like I find excuses to go do work around the house. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. She's like, hey, can I get your helper? I was like, oh no, I'm actually just rearranging the garage right now. She's like, oh, okay, that's great. You know? yeah, yeah. Hey, can I get your helper? No, I'm actually I'm, I'm under the house today and I'm actually gonna organize all the boxes underneath there to make sure that we know exactly where the Christmas stuff is. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> well, I'm off to go wash the cars right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I've always got chores to do. That's hilarious. Yeah. Dude, I read a crazy Freedom. I read a crazy article. <clears throat> yeah. You guys are not gonna believe this. So you guys remember Death Row Records? Yeah, man. Yeah, Death Row Records. That was who was that? That was uh, Snoop Dogg, uh, Dr. Dre. That was okay. Guess who bought them? Who? You'll never guess. Who bought Death Row? Death Row Records. Tupac. He's no. still alive. Tupac's no. still alive. Yeah. 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 His hologram. No, no, no. Yeah. Hasbro. 
Hasbro. Yes, Hasbro. The the gummy bears? Ha- no, come on, bro. That's horrible. That's horrible. Are they on like G.I. Joe? That's <laughs> horrible. Yeah, just <laughs> fuck that up. <laughs> Not the gummy bear. Yeah, no, no, Hasbro, the company that owns Furbies, My Little Pony. G.I. Joe. The toy franchise. Oh. Yeah. They bought Death Row Records. Bro, you know how Records. close that was to the gummy bears? That's hella yeah. close. What are they going to do with Death Row Records? <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Death Row? Yes, dude. Like Suge Knight, yes. isn't he like still? Uh, uh, He's in jail. part of it. Do, like, He's in jail. do they buy him with it? Like, what? How does that work? I, I don't know, but they own Death Row Records now. It was in the source, and I read the title, and I was like, "This can't be real." Yeah. Sure as hell is. What are they gonna do? Make a bunch of '90s dolls? Yeah, I don't know. '90s dolls, some some uh, big chains. I don't know. Does Death Row even make music anymore? I I, I don't know. That's, That's a good question. That how is good hilarious! Question. And speaking of business, remember how last week I brought up uh, how Gillette was changing their advertising strategy because their toxic masculinity yes. strategy yeah, seemed yeah. to backfire. Ooh, backfire. You know how much money they lost in share value? How much? From that, $8 billion. $8 billion? $8 billion. No dollars. fucking way. $8 billion they wow. lost. Wow. <laughs> so this is all shares? Like people just like dropped I believe so. Ownership? Yeah, I forgot how they said it. It's not like $8 in profit, but yeah, they lost $8, $8 billion in value. I don't even feel bad for them. No, wow. They, no, they did that themselves, man. Well, this is what happens when you, you, know, you roll that dice. You take that gamble of like, well, I'm going to totally divide my audience. I, mm-hmm. I, I have a question for you, Sal. You're going to get mad that I'm bringing this up oh, too. God. Or Doug's going to get mad. Because uh-uh. uh, it's it. I, I'm going to try, try your best to not get super uh, political about it. Oh, you don't want me to rant? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question because I don't know a lot about it, and so I just want to, I, I want to be more informed. The whole... Uh, uh, I knew it. Yes, the fire, dude. You got you to gotta school me on what's going the on. The Amazon fires? Yeah, yes. Oh, mm. man. Boy, so because here's here's why I'm asking, because I've got several... Everyone's DMing me about it, and I've and it, everyone's like up in arms over it. Okay, so... And I've, and I've read some things about it that... Uh, some there's alarmists all about it that are freaking yeah. out and making it big. And then I've heard other people be like, calm the fuck down. All right, it's so not even our biggest year of fires. So two things I want to address. Number one, uh, the Amazon has been t- called the Earth's <clears throat> lungs. Um, that's actually scientifically inaccurate. The vast majority of the oxygen that's produced by, uh, by plants is produced by marine plants, um, algae in particular, something like 70 to 80%. The real statistic in terms of the amount of oxygen that the Amazon is producing is probably closer to 6 to 8% of the Earth's uh, oxygen. Now, that's still a ton. That's a lot. So I'm not trying to diminish anything. But I wanted to say that because a lot of people kept saying the Amazon produces 20%, 30%, 40% of the Earth's oxygen. That's actually- Well, yeah, that that's sounds actually, more extreme. Yeah, that's <laughs> actually not That's not true. Um, every year, there's a fire season that happens in the Amazon, and, and we're in it. And NASA, actually, on the official NASA- website talked about whether or not this year was worse than others. Now, this year is far worse than last year. It's something like 80% more fires at the same time last year uh, when you compare this year. But that's how fires tend to work in the wild. If there's less fires this year, less of that brush gets burned off, then the following year tends to go up. So what NASA did is they published broader data, and they said in their uh, in their data in on the actual NASA website that this is not out of the ordinary um, when you compare over the last 15 years. So over the last 15 years, this kind of falls along the average of the fires um, that have happened in the Amazon. Now, the fires are largely happening on um, farmland. So these are farmers who are burning off um, you know, old grass or whatever to, per, to put new grass. So not burning old... So it's contro- they're not burning Amazon trees. They're not going in the forest and burning trees So it's controlled? Um, uh, yes, I believe a lot of them are controlled and human, human started. Now here's why there's a lot of uproar. Now, first off the, the, the slash and burn, uh, you know, burn, uh, you know, plants and then farm. That's been something that environmentalists have had an issue with for a very, very long time. So it's been happening for a very, very long time. But the reason why everybody's so up in arms about it right now is because, uh, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio posted about it, um, and it's become politicized. Um, so I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying the reason why we're seeing an uproar now is because it's become now a politicized. This is what politics do: is they take a topic and they'll 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 turn it into yeah, a weapon. Add gasoline to their cause. Yeah, they'll turn it into a weapon to fight each other. So, no, this is not. And this is this is based off of NASA's statistics and websites. This is not my opinion. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not an expert on this uh, at all. I just went literally off of what the NASA website says. 
but they say that it is not out of the ordinary if you look at it in terms of a 15 or 20 year uh, time frame. Um, but people are all up in arms about it and acting mm. all like, oh my God, this is, uh, you know, this is crazy. This is something new. We're destroying the planet. You know, no, this has been going on for a long time. Again, not saying it's good or bad. Um, just saying it's not out of the necessarily out of the ordinary. Like a lot of people are believing that mm. this is something new and it's this crazy emergency that we need to all I watched, direct resources to fight. I watched uh, a documentary like three years ago, I think it was, three or four years, it was a while ago, uh, and I wish I remember the name of it, but it was actually really interesting because I didn't know that it's necessary that we have X amount of fires a year anyways. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. Like, I think yeah. that we have that's a part to burn of the, off the underbrush. That's a part of the cycle of the yeah. of the of many forests. Yeah, and this documentary actually kind now of these made, are these fires have been set by farmers. It brings though. nutrients back to the soil. It does, but a lot of these fi fires have been set by farmers. Yeah. And a lot of it it's on a, a lot of it is on it's not burning old rainforest. It's burning uh, grasslands that they're uh, burning to clear for new growth so that they could have their cattle graze on it. And that's a, a lot of environmentalists have a problem with that as well. The, here's the thing with um, the, the environment. It's extremely complex. It's very, very complex. And there's a litmus test that you can, if you want to find out how much science people know, um, if someone's really concerned about the environment and they want clean energy, ask them what they think about nuclear power. And if they say, oh, my God, no, nuclear power is bad. We can't do it. Then you know that they actually don't know yeah. uh, a lot of what they're talking about because nuclear power is actually extremely clean and very – it's a very viable energy source. The reason why we don't do no nuclear is because it's a political pariah. Like if you're a, a, pol a politician and you say you want to promote nuclear power, nobody will vote for you because, A, everybody's scared of it. Right. And, B, we don't want lots of countries having nuclear power because – with that comes the ability to nuclear bombs. Yeah, um, and there are other ways to do it, but you know we try to stay away from it, um, type of deal. But it's a very complex uh, s situation, mm. and this it's just another issue that's get pol that gets politicized and simplified. It's not nearly as simple as they want you to believe. And no, it's not this crazy, brand new emergency. Um, mm. Again, not saying it's not bad. Just saying, it's not this new thing that everybody needs to coming from NASA. Freak though, out I don't about. know. They still believe the the Earth is round. So. <laughs> yeah, they, they tend to be wrong Question that. on that kind of stuff. Anyway, <laughs> speaking about more controversial subjects, you guys see KFC? No. <laughs> yes, I did. No, what? Oh, what? Of course you can bring this up. So, the, the stupid, uh, the impossible meat, like nuggets. They're I making they're nuggets making, now. Yeah. Yeah, KFC is now making chicken yeah. like fried. Can we put? Is it? Is it? Does that make us bad if we buy stock in this company? What the uh, the uh, Beyond Meat? I yes, just, I don't or want whatever to, Impossible dude. Meat. I know. I hate to do it too, but I swear to God, bro, there's gonna, such an agenda right now. There it's is. Just, Did you crazy. see what's going on with Rob Wolf right now? You uh, see his post? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. His oh. site, his site, and many other sites. Yeah, Mercola, Examine.com. I didn't know this. Examine, WebMD, a bunch of them, dude. That they've lost uh, tons of visibility on Google, like yeah. ninety percent bro some of the yeah. most yeah like the best uh, informational websites out there are like getting deprioritized yeah. because what? they're pro meat because is, yeah it, they have it, it could be that or it could be I, I wonder what their reasons are for doing that is it that they're trying to uh you know what is it what is it fight fake news and stuff like that or i don't know because hmm. i know i know mercola is extremely controversial well that one yeah, yeah. rob yeah. wolf isn't very controversial i don't know why he would be targeted examine.com I saw was on that list also. They've lost something like 89%. Mark's Daily Apple. Yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah e examine.com is one of the best sites you could go to for supplement information. It's super, it's very objective science-based. It's weird, right? Yeah, but it's just, it's just so strange people would go to KFC for like a vegan meal. I just can't get past that. It's like you're in the land of murder <laughs> yeah. you know, and you're <laughs> dipping your little nuggets in there like while somebody else is munching on a you know on a, on a chicken leg right in front of you. Yeah, doesn't it seem kind of weird? Like uh, would a vegan actually want to go to KFC? That's what I, I mean. It's, it's like, because today today's it's, vegan is different, bro. Today's it's vegan kind of becoming a trend. It fact. is. Mm. I'm telling you, I've watched all my little nieces and nephews and cousins that are like two generations behind us that are coming up. And ever, it, 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 I guess maybe I wasn't aware of it as much before until that what the health documentary came out. But after that, dude, I've got all these like little cousins that like they don't understand anything. 
But because of that documentary and it, so many millions of people saw it and that became, now it's like a trendy thing to do. Mm. It's just such propaganda. It's so trendy. And, and what they think, they think they're saving the environment and they think it's like this. Healthier. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's healthier and we're saving the environment. And so it's a win both ways. So we should all try and be that way. No. And, and vegans who, who are serious about it and have been doing it a long time will 100% back up what I'm about to say. If you want to be a vegan, <clears throat> You need to be extremely informed and have a well-planned diet. Mm -hmm. You have to, or you will suffer from serious health problems because having nutrient deficiencies is extremely common with a with an unplanned or not informed vegan diet. The truth is, we're like everything else in this world. There's always the swinging of the pendulum, and right now it's swinging hard this direction. And unfortunately, what's going to bring it back is when all the shit happens. When mm. people have been on this for fucking five years and they get all these deficiencies and issues start coming up, we're going to see it. Well, it's when crazy. You have, when, you, when you got a bunch of 15-year-old kids that don't know dick about nutrition that are just running around just trying to avoid that's meat because, all it's, they do. because it's popular, yeah. uh, that's where they're going to get fucked. Yeah. And we're not going to see that come out in six months, one year, two-year time. It's going to take five years to a decade of these yeah, kids. Their hair doing, is going to start falling out. Their yes. bones are going to start getting weak and, and they're going to start, you know, their their cognitive function will start to decline because that's what happens yep. when you're in a nutrient deficiency. I mean, consider this. The average person, the average American is is so misinformed on a, any diet. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have they have bad planning with just a standard regular diet. You want to tell that person now to eliminate meat, which is where they get some of their essential nutrients and continue on their uninformed path. The only information they have is, I'm not going to eat meat because it's not good for me and it's not good for the environment. Terrible advice. You're going to cause a lot of problems, and you're actually going to cause, cause the environment more problems. As their health problems and issues start to go up, uh, That there's some cascading effects that, that happen from that. Yeah. That brings me to an article. There was a, a, a couple in Australia that almost lost their child. Um, both almost lost their child because their kid almost died, but then the courts almost took their kid because they put their, their child on a vegan diet. And this 18 month old had such bad nutrient deficiencies. They didn't even, they, she wasn't even growing teeth. Oh my God. What? And yeah, they went to court, um, because the court, you know, the, the, the government's like, you're, you, you know, you're, you're malnourishing your child. Yeah. They almost took their child away. Um, but they, the court agreed to give them back their kid so long as they'd feed them differently. Really? But the, the nutrition was so bad, this kid was undersized, teeth weren't coming in. I mean, you need, to, you need to know what you're doing if you're going to eat a vegan diet. And I will. most vegans need to supplement. It's just it. It's the bottom line. If you're a vegan, you probably should be looking at taking some supplements uh, long term. But there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong at all with that. But it's just a reality Otherwise, you're going to put yourself in a very, very bad position. We're not just talking about eating too many calories and being fat and all that stuff. Nutrient deficiencies will kill you, um, and they'll cause real, real problems. So that's what I'm saying. We're not going to. See, unfortunately, we're not going to see this start to come back the other direction. I think we're going to keep going this crazy for a while mm -hmm. until that stuff starts happening. Mm -hmm. and then it'll wake everybody the fuck up, and then you're going to see the, the well because it's making everybody money too. You yeah. know these these meats are popping up everywhere, and it's. I mean, what a great opportunity for these companies. No, let's talk about that for a second. Okay, you cannot patent an animal yet. Okay, uh, I'm sure they'll figure this out at some point, but I can't patent cow, I can't patent chicken or eggs, but you can patent plants. Yep. That's been happening since the mid '90s, right? Yeah, the GMO corn, right? GMO, all GMO, all GMO, anything, all GMO uh, genetically modified plants are patented, which means if I sell uh, a, a GMO corn or soy. Nobody else can sell it. Now I can really make a fucking shit ton of money right. on this product. Nobody else can compete with me uh, unless they go with a different product. That's why I think the uh, the investment on like the Impossible Burger right. the company is so <laughs> it's brilliant. It's all GMO. Because, because if once you hit it out the park and people yeah. love the taste nobody of it. Nobody can copy it. Yeah, nobody can fuck with you. It's patented. Our, our, our alter ego company can uh, purchase it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, it's different. Like, but it's like if I, if I come up with a, like if I made like a really good steak, um, uh, people can compete with me because they can make steak too. They yeah. could, they could, you know, or a burger. They could compete with me, but they can't compete with my, you know, impossible meat nuggets or burger. Yeah. That's owned by a company. And let me tell you, if you everybody knows this in, in business, if you want to make a shit ton of money, if you can come up with a product that you can patent, now you're protected against competition uh, along some lines. And that there's a lot of people pushing that. Well, I just came out with the unbelievable hot dog, so yeah. <laughs> beat that. Unbelievable hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> don't Google that. Uh, you don't believe it. Yeah, anyway. 
So Adam, you were talking about some Uber article that you were. Oh yeah, no, I was cracking actually, up about. Yeah, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was funny. I just thought it was interesting because it, it, right now I feel like you know Uber and and Lyft are like. I mean, do you guys have friends that are doing it? Like I have mm-hmm. a ton of people yeah. that do it. It's becoming so popular, and I was just reading this article about you know ten things I wish I knew before uh, starting an, an Uber and uh, or Uber or a Lyft. Uh, a lift job, and I just thought they were interesting things that people might want to consider before doing it. One of them is uh, to make the most money possible, you need to avoid traffic. Seems kind of obvious. <laughs> Good things to come to those who wait. Uh, don't drive around looking for a ride. Let the ride come to you. Um, the closest driver to a passenger usually gets the next ride. Position yourself accordingly. So strategically setting yourself up. Um, uh, you need to take breaks often for your health and for your sanity. Driving nonstop will kill you. The secret to high rating and more tips is having a clean car, offering a good... This is... I like this one, too, because I brought this up in the last Uber. I think you guys were with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Having the little charging yes. cord. Yes. Offering a good phone charger and driving safe. So, driving safe, of course, because I know Sal and I have almost been hit a few times when we were driving oh, right. Ubers. Oh, dude. Sketchy. Right? We were in a car that was like... The guy was... <laughs> it was... It was like a bumper car, man. <laughs> and I, I don't know, maybe because we go in, we travel a lot, so we're in these a lot. Hundred percent. Like if you're, in, if I'm in a clean car, and the Uber driver offers those long cords yeah. with the different charger options, so you you know, no matter what phone you have, I think mm. that's like such a clutch move. Didn't Lyft just was it Lyft that just got a bunch of uh, like sexual harassment suits or <clears throat> something did. like that? Oh yeah, I didn't. They see did. That. I had that in my notes actually to talk last week. I f- totally forgot about that. Yeah. So what was the deal with that? Was it was it the company? So what what. People- ha- Ex employees? No, 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 no. What what was happening was it, it, there was there were six, I believe, um, uh, sexual harassment charges, and they were different thing cases. Like some of the Uber drivers, you know, that took somebody home. You mean Lyft drivers? Li- yeah, excuse me, Lyft drivers. You know, followed the girl in and then tried to either rape her. What? Or oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. So you had situations like that. That was like one situation. Another situation, somebody was just kind of verbally harassed. Another situations, they were touched. Other situations, they were trying to take them somewhere else. Like, so they've had these different cases that have happened. But with there, the you have these people that are using Lyft. You know, I, I don't think Uber is. I think Uber went through this before too. There it is, right there. So I, Uber had already had this. So Uber had issues just like this too, because it's like there's not like a. It's not hard to become an Uber or a Lyft driver. Yeah, almost anybody can do it. You know, that includes pedophiles too and fucking weirdos. No, I don't know. I think they have to go through background checks. Okay, yeah. well. Okay, if you're not an, uh, if you've not been offended of being a pedophile, sure, sure, or sure. you know what I'm saying, but you could still be a creep. Well, you know what I'm saying, and not well, have a record. Well, here's why I'm saying this. taxi cabs. I mean, I've yes. always been suspect of those guys. Yes, this is what I was going to say. Is I wonder how many sexual assault lawsuits happen just to taxis. Yeah, I don't. The years, you know yeah, what I'm saying? I, I, so when I was going to bring it up, so it was on my notes to bring it up the other day. Like, it, I don't think of it as like this is. I don't think like Lyft. Like there's more. Because- yes, I don't think there's more with Lyft and Uber than there was with taxis. I don't yeah. think they're, they're mm-hmm. the people are any more creepy. I actually think this is just an interesting way that you know people are trying to take them down or you know, get, go after them. It's like trying to hold Lyft responsible yeah, for human somebody. behavior. Inevitably, there's going to be assholes so, out there. But I mean, I- how is that any different? Like, so if one of our employees you know, that we hired went out and sexually harassed somebody, we would be held liable yep. for that. So that's what's happening is there. So Are they being held liable? Uh, right. So they're, sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so I would venture to say. crack down hard on that. I would venture to say Uber and Lyft would be safer than taxis. And here's why. When you take a taxi, you don't have the person's name and picture and driver's license on your app. Right. When you take an Uber, I have all that information. Yep. So I have the guy's face. I have his everything. So I bet you, I, I would venture to say you're safer in an Uber or a Lyft than you would be. I in a would taxi. agree too because, it, and it, I guess you get in a taxi, you don't know the dude. You well, don't know and shit. and one and a guy makes, let's say, a guy makes crude comments to some girl that's in there, and when she leaves, she has the option to one star, leave notes. Yeah, you can write a comment right away. Right. So yeah, try doing that with a taxi. The guy leaves, you're like, crap. Uh, what car was it? I don't know. Who do I call? Right. Right. So I do think that, believe it or not, I actually think that's probably better controlled through Uber and Lyft mm-hmm. than it ever has been before. Totally. But again, we're it's because it's a these. Massive- the reason why I'm saying that is we always have to look at context, right? So if you look at a company like Lyft, and let's say they had, I don't know how many, let's say they had 15. Uh, sexual assault lawsuits. Look at the context. How many total rides did they service within that period of time? Right, right. Mm-hmm. And is that a percentage? Uh, is that percentage normal? 
within how many, you know, w- w- with other companies, or is it lower well, or higher? Because it can sound terrible. And to your point, but it might be better. No, it, to, exactly. To your point, it, it's probably significantly better. We and we don't know. You know, there was there could have been thirty. Right. In the same we time frame and stats. ride, yeah, in taxis. But now, because it's actually very easy to track who the driver was, mm-hmm. complain, and do all those things, maybe because of that, we're seeing it more often. So then, of course, we're free. Because I would be, I would be. Um, here's what I would uh, look at. I, I know that the taxi companies really don't like the the d de, uh, decentralizing and disrupting effect of Uber and Lyft. I wouldn't be surprised if they love putting out information like this to make it of sound course, like, of course. oh, they're not as safe. Almost like hotels, you know, like with with Airbnb. You know, maybe one Airbnb guy has a hidden camera and people catch it. And so then the hotel companies will put out these articles and say, oh, look, people mm-hmm. are spying on whatever. Um, when in reality, it's again, could be far safer to Airbnb than even to hotel. Right. Use a hotel. Right. So who knows? Yeah. First question is from Elena Badina. What are your thoughts on the Whole30? Have you ever put a client on it? I actually... Um, when I think back to all the different diets that are out there, diet books and protocols, I would have to say that um, as a trainer, like you, you typically are are customizing everybody's nutrition plan. But if there was ever something that I just pointed someone in a direction, like maybe they weren't, they didn't hire me, they had questions, I've actually pointed more people towards Whole30 than almost any other diet out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just think that the 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 principles behind it are really, really solid and probably aligns the most with the philosophy that I would teach my clients. We've talked on the show many times about, you know, I, I remember having clients and they'd come back and they'd be they would be struggling with the diet and I'd be kind of asking them, oh well, you know, I, I, I'm eating good and then I find out they're eating out here or they're they're eating these things that I think are just really tough to track and they're processed foods and I'm like, oh, they're probably also under reporting. And I'd be like, listen, you can eat instead of us trying to calculate and count when you're going out to the like mm-hmm. eat whole foods your own whole. It food. targets the major offender, right? It does. Away, it does, which is great, mm-hmm. and and then it, it focuses you on like having to go get food, which is better than eliminate this, eliminate that. Like I need to be able to get more of these whole foods. How do I do this? I totally. have to actually cook it. Totally, and it's like it brings it back to that simple thing where if you're in charge of like you know chopping everything yourself and and putting it together, it's a much more more intimate and, and you, and you, uh, you know, much more sustainable. I think that, I, I think you nailed it right on the head right there with the, the, the part that we learned later on, I think as trainers was when you, when you tell clients, they have to eat this really restrictive diet. They, they have a hard time with that. Cause it, it's still, it just feeds into that whole, I can, I can't have things and, or like a punishment thing, or it's only cause I'm on this diet right now. And then I'm going to be off the diet eventually versus you know, I I figured this out later on of like, oh, right away when I would start to adjust someone's uh, diet, I would actually never take away. It would I would start to infuse things into the diet. So instead of me saying like, oh, no more of that McDonald's or no more of that, I'd say what I want you to do is start eating, you know, a two cups of broccoli a day. What I found out and I figure or I figured out was if they ate a certain way and that was they're very consistent, even if that's bad, you know, bad choices like eating fast food and stuff but they never sat down and had you know two cups of broccoli in their day. When I asked them to eat two cups of broccoli, it naturally would eliminate something that was bad in the diet or that was mm-hmm. you know inferior to that as far as nutrient wise, right? So instead of actually telling clients like, oh, you can't have these things, like saying, hey, listen, you know, whole, these whole foods, go to town, eat these foods, you know, enjoy them, eat till you're full. Like, and it does, they don't feel like you're restricting them. You're just kind of putting parameters of like, Hey, let's stay away from like all the processed box things and eat around these whole foods. And I, I've had a lot of success. I've had a lot of clients that have had a lot of success with it. Um, I think, um, they notice a big difference. I think they notice the satiety. Um, I think that it speaks to the point that Sal always brings up that, you know, processed foods are, are are hijacking your your body's natural systems that tell you that you're full. So when you eat whole foods, it's a lot harder to do that, even if you do season up and stuff like that, which does that a little bit, but well, not to the same extent. Well, what I like about Whole30 is, and I do like it. I, I would agree with you guys. I think it's it's if you had to pick a diet, um, mm-hmm. that would be the one that I would say pick. And here's what I like about them is that they have a an elimination diet um, kind of built into it. And mm-hmm. so what I mean by that is they allow they tell you to remove the common offenders that people tend to have issues with. 
uh, things like you know, like like uh, certain uh, grains, like gluten, for example. Remove those out of your diet for the first 30 days. After 30 days is up, reintroduce some of these common offenders and then see how your body reacts and responds. And I like this because it brings a new level of awareness to a person. A lot of people don't realize that they're eating foods that they have digestive issues from or there's certain foods that cause them to feel a particular way. And so when they eliminate them for 30 days and then reintroduce them 30 days later, they start to pay attention to how they feel and they start to notice like, oh, wait a minute. When I eat lots of bread, I just don't feel good. Uh, My body doesn't feel good or my appetite gets out of whack or my mood's kind of whatever. Maybe that's what happens when I eat bread. Let me take it back out and see what happens. Whole30 does that. And that's the part of Whole30 that I like the most. It has that elimination component kind of built in. Most diets cut things out, leave them out. Um, Whole30 doesn't necessarily do that. It cuts things out and then it says reintroduce them slowly and see how you feel. So uh, I like it. I like it for that. I think people have had a lot of success as a result. It's not foolproof, of course, Mm. but it's good to know how your body feels because, you know, the way you digest things is is very individual. The way you react to foods can be very individual. There's a psychological component that's very individual. Some foods may be psychologically triggering for you. There's also the your metabolism um, and how your body works with these foods, your, your microbiome. It's all like a fingerprint. So, you know, Adam and I may go and eat a meal and that meal may make him feel different than it makes me feel. And I'm talking about everything from physiological differences. He may, I may get bloated from a meal that he feel fine from, or I may get tired or I may feel bad, or I may just have an emotional connection to that food and it triggers me to eat a lot of other foods. That's also something that we, that we have. We have emotional triggers. So it's good. I like that component. You take things out, reintroduce them see how you feel, it gives them a little bit more of a sense of awareness than most diets tend to do. Yeah, I like that it has, like, it's a strategy at the end of the day. Like, I look at diets as a way to kind of provide a structure if you're unstructured in the way that you're eating. And so it helps you to kind of, you know, really take that mindful time and and experience, like, and and pay attention to the signs and symptoms of what your body's telling Mm -hmm. you through that process. Yeah, here's here's the foods that they cut out in the first 30 days. I brought it up. I just wanted to be... 100%. 100%. So it's dairy, grains, alcohol, legumes, added sugars, carrageenan, MSG, and sulfites, and then junk food. Now, those are the most um, common offenders in terms of making people feel bad or giving them a food intolerance. Like dairy is a big one for me. Um, other people, it could be legumes. All, you Basically, if you're looking at people with their food intolerances, those foods right there probably cover, mm-hmm. including the, the the preservatives like MSG and stuff, those probably cover, I don't know, I would estimate 75 to 85% of the most common you know, issues that people have with food. So when you cut those out and then you reintroduce them one at a time after 30 days, like, okay, I'm, I'm done with my 30 days. Let me reintroduce dairy real slow because that's what the whole 30 tells you to do. And then you start to notice like, oh, uh, that's where I'm getting the bloat. That's where my bloat was coming from. It's from dairy. Now you know. Now you know what, what's causing these issues mm-hmm. and you can eliminate them or, or keep them in if you want. So that component is really what makes me enjoy it the most. It's the, it's the, it's the biggest commercial uh, you know, kind of elimination diet protocol that I've seen. Otherwise, I haven't seen too many that have that kind of commercial viability. Next question is from Double Zero Silk Drop. Do vegetables and fruits carry equal weight when it comes to nutritional necessity? It seems like they are always lumped together. You mean like in comparison to each other or in general like to other foods? To like- each other. Oh. So because, you know, we always say eat your fruit and vegetables. Like they're oh, put right. in the same category. Uh. Um, okay, so this is a great question. Now, I would say this in in the context of today, okay, so modern times, vegetables are more important than fruits. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to get uh, more nutrients. Vegetables tend to kick the crap out of fruits uh, uh, in terms of nutrients and how many nutrients they, they deliver to your body. They tend to be better in terms of fiber, um, and they are typically lower Low glycemic. in calorie and lower in sugar. Not always, right? Uh, Not corn, all of them. Corn right. is a vegetable, and I guess a, a potato could be considered one maybe. Um, but but they're, they're lower calorie, higher nutrient. I would say if you had to pick one or the over the other, go for vegetables. Now, if we look at the context of evolution and the context of you know when we were hunter-gatherers, fruit was more valuable because fruit 
typically had more calories and more sugar. Yeah. I know now that sounds like a bad thing, but let me tell you something. It was a good thing a long time ago. Yeah. Like you didn't if you were looking for food and you if you stumble upon a field of, you know, uh, broccoli or a field of apples, the apples are more likely to make you survive. Right. They've got more calories. They've got more more usable energy. More usable energy. Um, but these days, it's it's vegetables. It's yeah. I, I don't even push fruit on my kids that much. I mean, they'll mm-hmm. have some fruit here and there, and that's their snack every once in a while. Yeah. But it's the vegetables that make a bigger. Yeah, deal we don't about. have to worry about scurvy as much now, <laughs> yeah. which is good. Wouldn't you? I would say though, uh, a cup of a cup of berries from a fiber point. If we were going to compare, like if you have somebody who doesn't have. I'm trying to think of like all the times where maybe I've I've rec- actually recommended fruit. Yeah, that's a good exception, right? Yeah, like so you're like the, one one thing that I do common that's common. Like if I have somebody, I always have people, clients monitor their stool and pay attention to that. And if I have somebody who has constipation and I notice that they're really low on fiber, they're not getting enough, and maybe they're you know they have you know some asparagus spears at dinner and they had like a you know iceberg lettuce lunch and so they in their head they're eating enough greens and so they think they're getting a ton and they're, they're not, not a ton of fiber okay so mm-hmm. you know a handful of asparagus and a salad for for lunch doesn't equate to a ton of fiber uh, that somebody would need and if you're somebody who's listening and that is a could be a normal day for you uh, easily you could be eating under the, your yeah. daily requirement for fiber so having someone eat a cup of blueberries blackberries strawberries raspberries all the berries, um, is a, a good punch of fiber. No, this is a good point because on a on a, a volume to volume comparison, fruit actually does pretty damn good yes. when it comes to fiber. The difference is this: the difference is I can eat a lot more leafy green vegetables and not consume the calories. calories. Right. That's so. That's what I'm saying. In the context of modern life, like vegetables seem to be it's more power packed. Yeah, they yeah. seem to be better. You know, but oh, you're you, right on on a on a volume per volume. Berries have a lot of fiber. Right. Comparison. So that, that's where you, I wanted you to be careful with us recommending that direction because there's been many times where I've had clients that are not eating enough fiber and just simply trying to get them to eat a little bit more vegetables. Is, it's hard because the amount of vegetables that you need to eat, if you if you were to do no no fruit at all and get all your fiber from vegetables, you got to eat quite a bit. You do. Oh, yeah. You got to eat. That's, that's a lot. Of, that's vegetables a, are meant to be that <laughs> way, by the way. They're meant to be eaten a lot. Eat yeah. the fuck out of them. That's, they're so low in calories. If when humans ate vegetables in the past, we ate a lot of them because right. they didn't give us a lot of calories. They're so not we as sat exciting, we sat down and we ate yeah. a shit ton of them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's the way you're supposed to eat vegetables. You're not supposed to have just a little bit of vegetables. You're supposed to have a lot of them. And I recommend to people, uh, what, especially people with digestive issues, cook them. Cook your vegetables. Cook them well. It makes them easily easy to, easy to digest. Don't eat them raw. My God, you eat a lot of raw vegetables and you're. You're in a whole world of hurt. You guys uh, ever do that? Uh, that would destroy me. You ever eat like a bowl of raw broccoli? No. I've oh, never, you're I've fucking never hurting, dude. Yeah. I did. never even said a machine. I could yet. see you doing that. That's never I been did do that. Me. I did do that once, and I was. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't until we. I never even ate vegetables like that until we met. Until we met, and I remember it really was when we saw Doctor Terry Walls. That's right. right? When we yeah. interviewed Doctor Terry Walls, she kind of really opened my eyes on like. Even on my my highest vegetable day, I was grossly under eating. Still on on what we, what we could yeah be that taking. resonated with me a lot too. Yeah, like I'm just not doing enough. And I know Sal's already by that time was already doing his you know bowl like his giant bowl bring up of <laughs> yeah bowl of rapini that was stink the entire joint up. Yeah, man. and I I just I had never <laughs> ate vegetables like that, and so it wasn't until you guys and Doug also with like his his Brussels sprout recipe like I, now I do this like now I will sit down and have a giant bowl of Brussels sprouts or I'll have a giant bowl of rapini or broccoli or spinach. Like I eat huge things of spinach all the time. So I never did that before. And so I, I imagine there's a lot of people listening that are probably like me where they considered themselves, oh, I eat vegetables. Like I didn't not eat vegetables, but I was not getting nor- nowhere near enough of what my body probably needed. Uh, and not and not and I know there's someone rolling their eyes right now because it's not needed to survive, but to to be to optimal get, health. Yes, for optimal health. Yeah. What are the differences that you notice when you eat a lot of vegetables? Oh yeah, no, oh, my, my digestion is awesome. Digestion, your stool, your your energy levels. My, uh, I mean, I, it just I felt a ten times better skin. Like I noticed a lot of little things like that that were. That were different when basically I w- everything vegans promote. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. that's when it actually. Yeah, no, no, hundred percent. So uh, that to me, that, those are the things you have to kind of consider. If are you getting that much 
that many vegetables in a day. And if you're not, then I do see a lot of value of, of making sure fruit is integrated in there also. Yeah. So it's like you either need to, you need to have a day that is just plentiful of lots of vegetables and sitting down and actually having a big bowl of, of vegetables at one point in your day. And if you didn't, that would be a great day probably to have, you know, a small cup of berries because a, a, a one cup of berries is packs a nice punch when it comes. That's to That's like such a good point. I guess it would be this. If you're just going to have a little bit, fruit might be better. If you're going to have a nice, big plate vegetables will probably be better from a nutrient standpoint energy wise fruit kicks ass they're packed full of, of energy if we cut out the starchy vegetables that you know like corn and, and and potato i guess you can put in there um but otherwise i mean they're both pretty damn good they're they're great for you you can overdo you can overdo fruit i'll, I'll say that fruit is so damn palatable I've had clients in the past uh, just because I said, yeah, eat fruit, don't worry about it, and they just went nuts on it <laughs> um, and just ate incredible amounts of fruit, and then we had to reduce their fruit intake so that they could drop their calories. So you can't overdo the fruit as well, but they're both good. Um, it depends on the context, I guess, would be the answer. Next question is from Chris DJ. If you had one hour with a high school gym class in a weight room, what would you do with them? Mm. This is a challenging one because I was I saw this up there and I was already kind of thinking about it like what would I do I know what I would do but the the problem with what I would do is I don't know how well this would do in a high school class I'm um, so disconnected from that age group and I don't know the intention span like in my this is what I if I was like a, a, a high school gym teacher like I would love to be like you know all month long we're talking yeah. the squat I know. All I was things, just thinking one exercise, yes, yes. maybe two max. Right. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Like all month, it would be like this month is the squat. And so we would learn the squat. We just would practice the skill. I would show the difference between students and what's going on with each one. Like, oh, he's he's limited here because of his ankle mobility. Oh, she's limited here because of her hip mobility. And like pointing out all these things and teaching them. Like you could teach the squat. Obviously, you teach the squat for a whole year. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I would, I would focus on a, a movement, especially the big compound lifts, right? So for the first five or six months, I'm going through, you know, squat month, next month after that, deadlift month, you know, overhead, overhead press, press month. Yeah. Right. And and then trying to break down all the things that are important to, you know, to getting better at it. Now, geez, I don't know how many kids would love like, hey, guess what we're doing today again? <laughs> Squatting with Mr. Schaefer. You know what I'm saying? Hyper focus. <laughs> yeah. Like fucking it's not late. that exciting. Yeah. Man. But I, I want mean, to CrossFit. What's going on here? Right. In a perfect world, though, I mean, at that age, those kids are really starting to starting to figure out that working out is important. Most of them don't have very good mechanics. Um, so I think what they would benefit the most from would be taking a, a I, single exercise. You'd in. have to yeah. change. You'd have to completely change their focus, right? Because- in high school, when you're lifting weights, especially when it's a bunch of guys lifting weights, it quickly becomes yeah, who's, who's stronger. Yeah, who's mm. the strongest to see who can lift the most weight, right? That's what you value the most. So you'd have to really sell hard uh, and make the case that it's about technique, practice, and form, and practice these exercises. And we're going to use weight that is, you know, that's light. And we're going to do today. We're going to do, you know, three exercises, and we're going to practice these until we get really, really good. You have to sell the shit out of that because naturally you just want to see who's the strongest. It's interesting that somebody brought this, I don't know who brought this question today, but um, you know, I someone, a good old client of mine who I used to train for many years uh, is a high school teacher at one of the lo local high schools. And she's actually, they put together a whole presentation that I guess they used our, a uh, bunch of our YouTube videos to all the gym classes. So I think a couple hundred students uh, were, was watching Mind Pump TV on, uh, I don't even remember which ones they were using, but I saw that she'd shared it with me. And I said, you know, let me know uh, when would be a good time. I said, you know, maybe we can get down there and talk. And I'd really like to start to make our way into high school. So this question makes me try and think of like how we would go in there. And I think that's what we would do, Sal, is I think we would go in and really make the case. That's it. Sell for, that. Sell the idea of why good mechanics and not just being, you know, being able to lift a lot of weight is, is more important. And then, and try and challenge the kids to not only get stronger, but also work on improve the, improving the movement itself. Mm -hmm. I and think how that kids would be receptive to it. I mean, I was in a, they had a weight training specific class that wasn't like an elective that I took in high school. And, uh, you know, on top of already doing like team workouts and things, um, where they kind of got a little bit into the mechanics of it, but it was very like all over the place. Like I would have loved to have 
very specific, you know, cues and techniques, you know, revolving around just a squat or just an overhead press. So I could master those things and you could, you could really dive into posture. You could dive into like why, you know, there's discrepancies and in, in how to address those things as you go through the process. Yeah. Those, those are the two exercises that I'd really love to yes. focus on the squat and the overhead press. I right. think those Especially are probably, for kids. Yeah, absolutely. Just the bit mechanics and the form. And then slowly getting them better. And because at that age, just practicing, actually, this is at any age, but especially at that age, just practicing form and technique and getting better at it, you're going to get stronger. You're going to get a lot stronger. A lot of the reason why a 24 year old is so much stronger than a, than a 17 year old isn't because a 24 year old is bigger. Um, a lot of it's just they have more control over their body. Yeah, more so time under you, the belt. And that's another one. You, you could, that's maybe one of the ways you could sell it to the kids and say, look, you're. 15, 16 years old, trust me, you have way more strength than you know you do. You just don't have know how to access it because you don't have the control over it. Uh, just like a dog when it's a puppy and it, it's, you know, it, it, a year and a half old, it's as big as it's going to be, but it's all clumsy and it moves. That's that's you guys. You guys are a bunch of clumsy pups, eat puppies. And I'm going to teach you guys how to move better and really learn how to harness your strength so you can have that old man strength like your dad. That's why yeah. your dad beats you up and, you know, when he wrestles <laughs> with you all the time. Yeah. You know, you have to kind of sell that to the kids so they kind of get it. Because otherwise they don't value. I didn't value that at all. When I was in high school lifting weights, I don't give a shit, man. Yeah. As long as I – there's a couple parameters. Did it touch your chest? Yeah. Did you get the bar up? Cool. You did the lift. You're yeah. the strongest. If I can bench more than you, I'm winning. That's all right. it. All right. All right. Next question is from the Mind Muscle Project. Do you use microwaves? After diving into Paul Check's work, we can't help but hesitate every time we use one. <laughs> so, Paul, uh, you know, here's the thing. There's definitely to be paranoid about everything. There's definitely things I disagree with um, with Paul, um, and this may be one of them. Now, Paul, I think is one of the he's the the godfather of the wellness space. Uh, it doesn't mean I agree with him every time, but the guy um, usually is spot on. Here's one where I disagree. Um, microwaves they heat up food in similar ways to heating up food with fire. Um, some of the arguments are how it, it causes the atoms in food to jiggle and shake, and that's what causes the heat. Well, that still happens when you heat things up. Anytime you heat things up, that happens. The molecules and, move around. Yeah, and some and there's there's evidence that even shows that microwaving produces less of the carcinogens and harmful things than fire does. Now, I'm not going to – I definitely won't say microwaving is better than heating up over fire, and the main reason why is because that's how we heat – That's we haven't been microwaving things nearly as long – so I'm pretty sure we evolved to do better with heating things up under fire. But no, I don't. I don't think there's any issues. I think with the it. I think the biggest argument with microwaving is the the leaching of plastic into the food, right? That that's true. Yeah. That's definitely true. If you microwave something, you need to. Yeah, use you don't some, want to do that. You don't want to use something that's going to leak chemicals into your food. Just like you wouldn't use a plastic container over a fire either. You know? yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, think about it. True, There's know. nothing. It, I Nobody's mean, doing that. Well, I mean, it's good to put it in context because yeah. somehow people think, the, oh, oh, it's a microwave. It's something different and worse. Like I wouldn't use a pla I wouldn't put my food in a plastic bag and put it over a fire either because it would melt the plastic. No, that's a really into good. My food. That, is, that is a great point. Yeah. It's, it's just it's not that it's much perspective. Yeah. It's much more invisible because yeah. of the microwave. The way microwaves work, it's not necessarily melting the container, although it can. It's really magic to me. I don't have no idea how that fucking. Works, yeah, well, the way that there's waves that move through the food that causes the the molecules of food, the of water molecules within the food, to shake and jiggle, and that causes heat, yeah. and that's what warms up your food, and that's why it warms up kind of from the inside out. You ever notice how things kind of warm up? Strange sometimes in a microwave. Yeah. I like the middle is hot, but the outside right. is you get the cold spot. Yeah, and, and you got to kind of you got to kind of mix it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. But no, man, they've been around for a while, and there is. To my knowledge, zero evidence that microwaving food is bad uh, besides what you warm it up in. Um, but I'm open to look at more evidence. I've read Paul Check's blogs on microwaves and some of the stuff that he that he quotes. You know, it's like there was a science experiment where a girl microwaved water, let it cool down, then she watered the plants and the plant didn't grow as much. And I'm like, I don't know if that's really a scientific study necessarily. Mm. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm open to looking at some of the stuff, but I'm not opposed to, to microwave. It's like when you're fine. negative and you put that negative energy on the water and then it changes. Like, have you ever seen that? I have, have the, seen Well, you that. remember he had the, he has the fucking, his moon, his, the moon changes his water and shit. Oh, he has the, he has the, cr the crystals in a circle. Yeah. And it, that's, and it, that's next it level. charges his water. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He's, he's just next hey, level. Look, here's, I, hey, here's the deal. Like, to me, it's uh, even if 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 it, his argument holds holds water, right? <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. Right? Yeah. Uh, even if, if even if it does, it's water under the bridge. Adam. It, there's so many other 
big rocks that I'm worried about first. You know what I'm saying? Like that that's the one thing I always try and 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 remind everybody who who hears like these these type of things that come out like oh the fucking plastics are going to kill us all. Oh, artificial sweeteners. Oh, it's like okay, artificial sweeteners aren't going to kill you if you're over consuming 2000 calories every single day and sitting on your couch. Like, well, you know it's going to kill you over consuming 200 2000 calories and sitting on your couch and not exercising is going to kill you before the artificial yeah, sweeteners. Before the freaking not, you know, the nonstick pan. Yeah, exactly. or whatever. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. the, you know, it's there's there's a lot of other things that you should be doing and and putting your energy and and in your you know, thoughts into then a lot of this Dude, stuff. I okay. So let me give you guys an example. Um, I learned this as a personal trainer, and it took me, it took me a year or two to really figure this out. When I first became a trainer, and I would get a new client, the client would come to me and would tell me their goal, and I would because I had all the answers. I was like, oh great, we're totally gonna get you to lose thirty pounds. Here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna work out three days a week with me. You're gonna do cardio every single morning on these days. Here's your macro profile. Here's what you're gonna do for your macros. Here's your calories. I'm gonna write up a meal plan for you. And I would give them so much shit that they would do nothing. Right. Yeah. It's called information overload. Yep. Okay. You become paralyzed with too much information. Think about starting a business for people who are listening who are entrepreneurs. Those people who had who now have a successful business, imagine if all the information you know now, now that your business is successful, was thrown at you when you first wanted to start the business. You would have never started. Yeah. You, I, we wouldn't have started this podcast had we known the real risks and challenges that would have come with it. We were kind of excited and pumped and naive. We didn't know. We're like, let's do this. It's going to be great. Now that we know what we know, looking back, we're like, wow, that was really insane how we did what we did. This is true for anything. And what's happening with a lot of this, what, and this, is the, this is the wellness, this is what the wellness space does terribly. Yes. The wellness space, this is the problem with the wellness space, is they oversaturate with so much fucking information on everything that people do nothing. Yep. So now rather than people... Eating a little bit less and, and moving. On, a little and bit honestly, less. the only the people that subscribe to it are the ones that don't even need it that much, right? Oh. It's the people that are already like super healthy. They're looking for like the next crazy level. Those are the people that adopt it and go like, "Oh, this is great. I'm so glad now. I don't ever use my microwave anymore." And I'm like, "I'm not. I'm using all this, you know, aluminum free deodorant, and I'm doing all these fucking things." It's like, yeah, but I'm eating sh way too many calories, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not active. You know <laughs> what I'm right. saying? You got to look at all the things that are most important. Tackle those first. And until you tackle those, stop worrying about everything else because everything else isn't going to do shit for you if you don't, you know, necessarily if you don't tackle the big things first. And so, again, the wellness industry does this really bad. So now you got a bunch of people who are like, oh, I, I'm not supposed to microwave yeah. my McDonald's Big Mac. Now that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, that being said, the same thing that I, that, that I approach in the same way I'm trying, like with like artificial sweeteners and stuff like that in, in my life is. You know, I just yesterday I was home and we had leftovers and maybe 10, 15 years ago, I would be naive enough to just throw my, my plastic container in there and microwave it up for a minute 30 and then eat it straight out of there. Where now it's like, oh, I'm at home right now. I have my iron skillet that's already on the stove. I just dump my food in the skillet and light the skillet up and, and then cook it on my and heat it up on my iron skillet then throw it back on a plate and I eat it that way. So I'll, I'll try and make what I think is a, a probably a better choice, but I sure as shit not freaking out or not Dude. gonna heat my food up one day because the because of the microwave. Here's what the here's what the if you're if you're in the fitness and, and wellness space, if you're in the health space and you really want to help people, you need to consider the following. You need to consider how you're communicating your information and how well it's being uh, understood on the other end. That's a big fucking part of it because I you know look we live in the information age today. Right now, everybody has access to all the information that's ever been recorded. This is no longer a I don't know or I don't have the the information problem. It used to be 100 mm -hmm. years ago, people didn't know. They did shit and they didn't know it was bad. Well, today, there's tons of information and yet people are still getting fat. They're getting mm -hmm. fatter and health is still terrible. So it's not an information problem. We don't need to inundate people it's with shit. It's a filtering problem. It's a, it's we're a not, prioritizing problem. We're not fucking selling it well, guys. You know, hey, we're not doing a good job. We're, I used to tell my, my sales guys this when they would give people a tour of the gym. They'd talk for two and a half hours. The person would walk out and wouldn't join. And I told them, I said, you talked them out of it. It was too much information. Fucking relax. Like, just communicate the important stuff. Do a good job with that. And you know what's going to end up happening? Here's what will happen. Let's say we do a good job and we sell to people in a very intelligent way 
that they need to start eating a little bit less, that they need to eat certain foods that make them want to eat less, so avoid the heavily processed food, that they should probably start eating more, that, oh, you only have two days a week to work out, why don't you focus on weight training, because that speeds up your metabolism, you get more bang for your buck, and then they do that. We do a good enough job that we sell those four or five things, they do a really, really good job, they do it, and they do it consistently. Well, guess what's going to happen next? Next, they're going to start looking at what chemical should I take yeah. out of my my? Then they progress. Then they start to progress. But worrying about microwaving your food, I don't. I I don't think that's a that's a. Now I my mind can be changed. My mind can totally be changed. But up until now, the information I've seen, it's not. It's like it doesn't make the top fifty for me in terms of things that I'll ever communicate to a client. I leave it out uh, until I'm talking to the perfect client that's doing absolutely everything. They're like, Hey Sal, yeah. what's the next thing I should add? I'll but, put it in there with my EMF underwear. It, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find us all on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, Adam at mindpumpadam, and you can find me at mindpumpsal.